When you grow up, as I did, looking at a historical monument, you sort of take it for granted. Derry's walls are world famous, but you'd be surprised how many people go to work every day on this piece of history. I'm now up on top of Shipke Gate, one of the original four gates of the city. And apparently the River Foyle used to come right up to this gate. It's hard to imagine now. The River Foyle's moved a fair bit, but the walls are still totally intact, making Derry one of the best examples of a walled city left in Europe. One of the many people who work on the walls is city ranger Kathleen Hughes. She's been coming here from an early age. This is a friend of mine, and she and another lady were tasked with taking me around the wall that day because I must have been sort of getting on my mother's nerves. <laughs> so that was taken when I was about two. Your first day on the walls then? The first day on the walls, and believe you me, I didn't think after all this time I would still be walking. Still be walking the walls? That's them. absolutely amazing, isn't it? Well, as a city ranger, primarily it's community safety. In relation to the walls, we would be looking out for things like broken glass, mm -hmm. dog fouling, mm -hmm. we're big on litter, yeah. you know. Of course then another aspect of the job, Rona, is the meeting and greeting. Yeah. And that's all visitors, tourists, whatever, coming into the town. Mm -hmm. um, they maybe want to know directions. They maybe want to know a wee bit of information about a specific place. Mm -hmm. So you try your best to help them in that way. Well, I'll catch up with you later on. Thanks a no million. Problem. Heading up to my favourite place now. Okay, bro. All the best. See, See you later, later. Bye. Take care. This is a great venue for live music and the technology state of the art, whether it's music, film or animation. The nerve centre has had several homes, but now it overlooks the walls. Well, I suppose that was part of our sort of vision from the very beginning, that we would try and get on to the walls, get right into the heart of the city, and we would, I suppose, have the best of both worlds. We'd have the sort of history all around us and what Derry's known for, and then we'd be representing young people's aspirations, you know, with new technology and sort of new industries, like the creative industries. What's your connections with the new Spanish Armada exhibition? Well, that was, I suppose, a great opportunity for us. I mean, we're on the same street as the Tower Museum, and so we've been able to use all the filmmaking, animation, graphic design, and musical sort of talent in the centre to sort of tell that story, I suppose, in a way that we feel would be much more appealing to young people. If you're at the exhibition, you get the information very fast, but how long does it actually take to create these images? So it's speeded up a bit by new technology, um, but um, some of the, the, the attention to detail and I suppose just I suppose, the idea of coming up with brilliant ideas and brilliant colours and, and, and brilliant visuals, I mean, it is a very, very time consuming, uh, but at the same time, very rewarding process for the artists. We've been commissioned to produce an entire 3D model of Derry in 20 or 30 years' time, sort of showing how the city might develop. And one of our key animators at the centre, John McCloskey, um, just spent the last three years creating a completely uh, new uh, film in 3D um, called Lucy and, and the Moon. Um, and I mean, the next step from that would be working towards, I don't know, at some point in the future, maybe trying to do a full-fledged animated feature here in Northern Ireland. Like paint in the fourth bridge, there's always work to be done. And you're on the walls every day? Every day. Of the year? We're, we're here all the time. So it's a constant it's restoration a, of project? Of course it is, of course it is. Amazing. This guy down here is pointing a little section that is cracked. What, what's pointing mean? Excuse me. Point, pointing is that that you see on the face of the wall. It waterproofs the wall. And how come that there's like a pinky glow of the of the material that you're using? Is that the lime? Ah, uh, well, it's the lime mixed with the sand. We use a red sand, you see, ah, which right. normal buildings use a brown sand. And would this have been the material that they used back on the day when they built the walls? As close as we can possibly get it, and the colour matching. If you look up that wall, do you see all that vegetation? That yep. has to be removed. All that pointing has to be cut out, 
and repoint it from the very top to the bottom. A big job, an ongoing job. It's incredible when you look at this structure, really. I mean, from a construction point of view and an engineering point of view, you think, how did they do it? Well, that's the 17th one. 17th century, and it's incredible. That is the one uh, from 1615 to 1618. But of course, big, big uh, workforce. This is that manpower. Big manpower, big no. manpower. Like any of the sort of wonders of the world, you look and it is. It's, uh, it's amazing what you can achieve we, in manpower. We have walls here 24 foot high and mm. uh, 6 foot thick with the, the earth bankings behind us. It's a b I know. big undertaking. Huge. Well, can we leave your hands full so I'll not uh, keep you anymore? Well, thank you. The better work you do. Exactly. <laughs> Ted, thanks a million. Thank you very much. God bless. Bye bye. This is a beautiful part of the walls up here. Those trees remember the 13 apprentice boys who closed the gates in the siege. But I have always been curious about the tiny graveyard beside St. Augustine's Church. Well, this present building dates from 1872. Yeah. But, of course, it stands on the site of earlier churches way back to when St. Columba yeah. had his settlement here. And he brought his monks here and formed his, his, his Abbey, oh. and this area, because of that, is called God's Little Acre, no, really? because of its religious oh. connections. Goes back so far. Yes. Oh. What a lovely name! This is the Montgomery tomb, who were the ancestors of Field Marshal Viscount Montgomery, and the last one here, as was his grandfather, Sir Robert Montgomery, who was a governor of the Punjab and a member of the Council of India, oh, wow. 1668. That's the oldest one that we can see, although there are older ones, but the memorials has disappeared. This is the tomb of the parents-in-law of Mrs. Alexander, Cecil Francis Alexander, who was the famous hymn writer and poetess. She lived nearby here in the what is now the Masonic Hall, right. which was then the residence of the Lord Bishop of Derry and Rafoe. And she died in that house. Right. And her funeral took place from that house to the city cemetery. Right, so she's not buried here? No, she's not buried here. Ah. She's in the city cemetery. And she was a great benefactress to the poor of all creeds. And her funeral procession passed through people lined the whole way from Bishop Gate to the city cemetery. Ah. That's the city cemetery. So Mrs. Alexander was laid to rest in the end on a green hill, something I never knew, even though I was brought up over there right next to it. This cafe is pretty unique. It's the only one actually on the walls and it's run by the Cookie Company. It provides training and work for adults with learning disabilities. Like soup, sugar curries and dinners, tea, coffee, serve customers. I work three years up here. It's a beautiful place to work, right. isn't it? I make uh, apple pies and making dinners for the customers, each cus customers. You're on the puddings? On the puddings, I. Oh, correct. Well, can I put an order in for four teas, please? I'll bring it straight down. Thank you. It's okay. It's also part of the Variable Arts Centre, a building that used to be First Dairy National School. Ambrose and Jim here have always lived close to the walls. Okay. What I remember was it was very happy times. I was born here underneath the walls, you may say. I learned to ride a bike up the walls in later years. I met a young girl. Took a walk round the walls. Did she take them up here? That's round the walls is one mile. Aye. As far as I know. So Sylvia, we're actually sitting in your old primary school, is that right? Yes, that's right. At one stage we had between six and seven hundred pupils in, in the this school. In this building here? Mm -hmm. And would you have played much around here in the walls, yes, Sylvia? Yeah. Well that was our playground. We played on the walls on, during our break times mm -hmm. and uh, we did our PE always in the walls. It was a very bleak school. It was the bare necessities. Mm. We didn't have central heating. We had big fireplaces with open fires. There was 10 in our family and we all went to First Dairy, different ages, you know. We were very happy oh. and um, we enjoyed our, our school life. You must see some change now coming back here oh, yes. today. The foyer was our indoor playground and it was just bars, there was no windows or anything. Uh -huh. It was actually quite cold in the winter time. The toilets were actually down there as well, which were very cold because there's no roof over no the toilets. No roof in the no. toilet. <laughs> Classic back to nature. 
The centre aims to promote song as well as the spoken and written word. Everywhere you look, there are amazing and unique works celebrating the verbal arts. The education and inspiration that started with the school is definitely still alive and well here today. These days it's rare to walk around the walls without meeting a party of tourists somewhere. It was kind of happened by accident, you know, because I, I used to be in the bed and breakfast business. I used to get asked all these questions about the history of Derry. Mm. And I didn't really know, I used to have to make up stories. <laughs> so I thought really bad about that. And then there was this course advertised back in 99 um, where you could qualify to be a guide. So I thought I would do the course just to kind of inform myself. Mm. But as it turned out, I enjoyed doing this so much, I thought. Do you want to make beds and fry eggs when you can do this instead? Oh, I <laughs> haven't looked back really, it's been lovely, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Brilliant, and you've got a tour of lovely Australian ladies here today. <laughs> they are just the best crack. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not, just, they're not just Australian tour ladies, they are all in the travel business. Brilliant. And they're all travel agents and they've come here to do a little familiarisation here of Northern Ireland. Yeah. yeah. And how do you find Jerry so far? Cold. cold. <laughs> Oh, you must have more than that. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> There's no houses actually on the walls anymore, but these come pretty close. The Fountain Estate is home to the Cathedral Youth Club and its samba band. The club was set up in the early 70s to keep the youngsters off the streets. Jeanette Wark's husband was one of the founders and she's still here 30 years on. The youth club's just like a place where we like hang out and relax. It's, like we could play a puller, we could go on computers. Meet all your friends? Yeah, just meet all your friends and... It's the only place we have, because there's it's... no parks. But there's no shortage of activities in and around the club to make up for that. Art is especially popular and every inch of space is covered with paintings. With the help of professional artists, it's one way for the children to express themselves and their community. They picked out the time the wheel uh, came up the River Moby Dick. Dick. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. I remember that. <laughs> uh -huh. And also the old Craig Avon Bridge, which they feel is important to them living here in the fountain. That's right. And those um, murals were done by the Bogside artists. Ah, right, right. These are uh, murals here were done by two lads in Belfast called Art Attack. The globe of the world here mm -hmm. shows where the youngsters have went to visit on their different uh, education trips. Oh, right. By land, by sea and by air. Is that a pint of Guinness I see? <laughs> Is that a top of a ship? Top of a ship. <laughs> <laughs> we don't encourage drink. <laughs> Good. <laughs> the two local lads from the waterside, Marty Eppers and Dee Logan, mm -hmm. were responsible for working with the young people on the siege and fold up murals. Right. We wanted to decide to do paintings in the walls, but we didn't, do, we didn't know what painting we wanted to do. Right. So the history project kind of helped us and do the pictures. We all had like a saying what pictures we got to do. The artist came along and drew it on the projector and then they put the projector up against the wall and just drew it off by projector and then painted it. And what's this picture of here? It's of the apprentice boys just outside the gate with Governor Walker. The Mountjoy and the Sparrow were carrying food into the city so they had to break the boom because all the people were starving. I wasn't really in my joy book of them. It was the boys that. Uh, the sparrow? No, it was the boys that were hacking at it, broke it, really. Oh, right, from and on then, the ship. And then they just broke through. And they brought all the food on then. And what cathedral is this now? The cathedral is up in the walls, and it's the local church everyone goes to. Yeah. It's like a picture, that picture, but it's, there's got a wee bit added on it. There was an aspire there during the stage. They must have only put the aspire on a couple of years oh, back. Oh, right, so that's painted as it was at the time of the yeah, siege yeah. in the 17th century. They put it on long before we were born anyway. Long before you were born, I'd say so. And why is this cathedral important to you? It's important to me because I live right near it Great. and I can go to it whenever I want to. Every, and uh, if you're, even when you're standing around here, if you just look up, you can see the top, it's that tall. We had a spire when the church was built, and the spire was made of wood and lead. Right. Uh, the wood started to rot, so we decided to take it down and build it again with new wood. Then the siege of Derry came along, and they mm -hmm. used the lead to make lead shot. So there was no spire on the cathedral then, until we had a bishop here called Bishop Hervey. And in 1778, he decided to build a spire on the cathedral. But the thing about Bishop Hervey, he was a very uh, 
big thinking man. Yeah. He thought that I'll build a big spire. So he built a spire of solid stone, 225 foot high. Great. It didn't last too long until <laughs> it, started to, come too down, long. it started to come down through yeah. the tower. So they took it all down again. And the spire that's on the church now at the moment uh, was finished in 1825. That's the third spire and we hope the last. When the church was getting its new oak pews, uh, two of the prisoners here who were woodcutters, a father and son, their name was Alford, volunteered to hand carve our pew ends. Yeah, these are beautiful. They hand carved 214 pew ends, all different. There's not two ends the same in the whole church. The skeleton on a city coat of arms has nothing to do with the seeds. Right. There's the very top part of it is the coat of arms of the city of London, and the bottom part is the old coat of arms of the ancient city of Derry. The de Burgo family uh, controlled most of Anishon and most of Derry back in the 14th century. Right. Richard was a Red Earl of Ulster and had a son called William de Burgo, and he also had a nephew called Walter, and the two boys grew up together with the best of friends. Right. When the Red Earl died, the two boys took over the running of Anishon right. and Derry. Now, William de Burgo got married, right. and behind his back, Walter was going with his wife. <laughs> the usual uh -oh, trouble. eternal triangle. Uh, trouble. Uh, so William captured Walter and locked him in a cell in Greencastle and bricked the cell up where Walter starved to death. So that's the skeleton of Walter de Burgo. And that's his own yeah. coat of arms. Incredible place, isn't it's it? It's a most wonderful place to uh, work, yeah. It really it is. is. It's absolutely stunning. Historically. It, it is. It's, uh, it's, it's brilliant. It's my first time here now. Well, you should have been here before now. <laughs> you know. Well, here now, maybe I'll not go. Well, maybe you stay with us. That's, that's, that's OK. You'll come again. Maybe. Good. Bye-bye. Still hard at it, Kathleen? Well, Brona, <laughs> and guess what? I found your reef flower. Oh, great. Remember the one I was telling you about? I do indeed. Last year, when we were in for the Britain and Bloom competition, right. one of the judges spied it. He informed us that this was known as pillatry of the wall, and it grows profusely here because of the old lime. Now, we thought it was a weed, of course. <laughs> I'm the wiser. <laughs> But he informed us that it was a very important little plant. It was used years ago for face creams, apparently. No. And in some parts of the world, they used it for medicinal purposes. It's only when you walk all the way around do you realise how many art venues there are on the walls. And this one takes me right back to my school days. Way back in 1774, the first purpose-built theatre in Derry was built here on Tilbury Street, at the very top of the uh, street. And in fact, after it opened, um, because of the numbers of people, the huge numbers of people that went to the theatre, they actually had to open a hole in the wall. And uh, that is where the, the gate gets its uh, name, New Gate, just because of the number of people who attended the theatre. And it's great to think here we are over 225 years later, still continuing uh, to keep on the tradition of theatre here on Atelier Street. We're very much based here on a neutral site within the uh, city centre, within, just across the walls themselves, and very much with both traditions here coming into the building and, and using the building and continuing that um, education where the building was set up away back over 130 years ago, continuing that here within the playhouse and the arts themselves. And I don't know, people just seem to, to like the venue. And the venue also, too, has a certain character about it, which a lot of new art centres don't have. I remember being actually in this room when I was still a pupil at the Nazareth House School and St Mary's School because we used to rehearse here for the fish before you would go down to perform at the fish. We would have a warm up rehearsal here just to make sure everybody had turned up and the wee voices were warmed up and then we'd all parade down the walls usually 
down to the Geltob where we perform in the fish. So I have great memories of this room. One of the best known parades uh, during the summer, as you know, Derry is well known like many other cities for its parades, but during the summer we actually have the Children's Art Festival, which is the longest running in the city, and we actually use the walls for parading down right. city centre and back up again, and very much bringing the walls to life. Uh, and we continue to use the walls for art exhibitions of one type or another, and we love that link. And very much we see the walls very much as, as, as a necklace with these jewels around in the playhouse of one, one oh, as many, yeah. you know. When the Playhouse took over this building, they discovered they had a sitting tenant. How is your mother this weather in? Mammy's grand, I. She sent her a yard, she was asking for you. Oh, lovely. Because ah. you used to teach Mammy art in St Mary's. I did indeed, ah. I did indeed. Uh -huh. That's right. Uh. I, taught art. I taught art, that's the wrong way to put it, I never taught art. But I was in the art room all the time. Uh -huh. But you didn't have to teach art in, in, in Derry. You didn't have to teach art to any Derry people, because it's in them. Aye. You just made them like it, and they and they got on, they got on well in spite of me actually. Uh -huh. they, they were they were really very good. And this is your studio here on the walls here in such an amazing location. It's a, it's a lovely place to be. Yeah. It's high enough up for nobody else to come unless they have to come. <laughs> I think I came to icons through just the love of the theology mm -hmm. of the icons, and I never intended to paint them because I actually didn't like them. I love the theology, but I thought they're too static and they're really? too immobile. Uh. And the things that, that turn me off at the beginning are the very things when they're explained that, that make me love them more and more. Really? And, more. and what was that? The pose mm -hmm. and the simplicity mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. geometry mm -hmm. and all that. That is an inner uh, religious, an inner spiritual significance. Right. There's so much to learn that I'm still learning still every time learning. I do uh. one. You know, but they're very, very slow. So when I'm saying, well, I'm finished with this and I'm going to just push paint around with the great abandon again. But the yes. minute I'm finished, I love it so much, I can't wait to start the next start one. The next one. And yeah. how long would it take to paint an icon? It's very different from painting. We, we talk about writing an icon because mm -hmm. you read it, you don't look at it. I keep this one specially to um, explain yeah. the difference between painting and, and the time factor yeah. involved because that one was where a friend of mine, Marsha Huggard, came in to visit me right. and I said, Marsha, I haven't time to be sitting here talking to you. And she said, well, paint me then. So I say, that painting, that was a couple of hours, but that same size of an icon could take me up to four or five or six really? months you may not have any mistake because uh, uh, there's no such thing as saying that will do. Yes. It has to be absolutely uh. perfect. Last time I looked, the Rialto was there. I wasn't expecting to find an archaeological dig on the walls, but here they've uncovered a 17th century house, cobbled streets and even ancient sewers. We were brought in uh, because the old Rialto Theatre site was going to get uh, redeveloped. Yeah. Uh, what happens is if there's thought to be our, uh, the potential for archaeology on a site, mm -hmm. the developer is required to employ an archaeological company to examine the site and to deal with any archaeology that's uncovered. And that's how we came to expose these remains. For someone like yourself, is it a pity that this site has to be covered up or is it just the way the world is cycle? It is a pity. When you get something nice, it's a pity. But again, it's 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 part of it's part of life. What these people would have done if there had been anything here before, they would have levelled it and lived ah. on it as well. So it's just part of the same process. And what actually happens now with all the information that you have collected here on the site? We'll take it back to our offices and examine it and write up a report. And that report and all the information, our entire site archive, will be lodged with the Environment and Heritage Service so that people in years to come can access that information. And when you get onto a site, you know, be it an urban site like this uh -huh. or be it a green field that's going to be developed, everything that's excavated, everything that we come upon, we're the first people to see it in Nebby. 200 years, 500 years, mm -hmm. 5,000 years. And it's that sort of buzz that keeps us going. We've got some souvenir slate from the dig, a wee bit of history. When you think about what you're walking on top of, it's kind of spooky.
This was an idea that, that came up about, uh, I put it to David McLaughlin, you know, what about a, a haunted house play? Mm -hmm. He was very much for it, so uh, he gave me a booking even before I had written. Any, I, I hadn't written a word, I hadn't written a line. Great. All I knew was I was going to call it the most haunted house in Derry. Great. Oh, oh, sure, mind the time you put me on your shoulders and, and you carried me the whole way to Greenland Fort. And I cracked me hugging over the mountain and all, and it started snowing, and we found like this wee cave, and you lit a fire. Oh, that was great, crack that. That was magic, eh? Magic. Yeah, great memories, son, eh? Took you up the mountain in the middle of winter, wearing number a t shirt and a pair of sneakers, and nearly got the two of us killed. So, Halloween is such a huge celebration in Derry. As far as I'm aware, it began in Maley's Bar. <laughs> down the bog side, yes. I think it's about 20, 25 years really? uh, ago that it began. Uh -huh. I've been actually given the names of Big Thomas McGowan and Wee Raymond Quigg, who, who you would, you would aye, be familiar aye. with, I Brona. do indeed, I am. Yeah, well, apparently it was them that started this whole thing off. I remember when I was about 18, I was filming in Dublin, and I had the costume set out in the bed in the hotel. I'm going to Derry the night. I have to be out of here at 4 o'clock to get the bus. Of course, the filming went on. Missed the oh, four o'clock bus, missed the, missed the six o'clock bus. Traumatised, absolutely devastated. All my school pals waiting here in Derry for me to come home. Didn't make the bus and just sat on my own that night crying in a oh. hotel. But you know how big a loser I really am, Sarah Jane? Well, now that you're dead, I'll tell you. I had a dream last night that I won the lotto. I could see all the balls dropping out of the machine. One, two, three, four, five and six. I mean, who'd be daft enough to pick a sequence like that? You know what numbers come out, Sarah Jane? 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 and 12. That's how big a loser in life I really am, eh? So, Brian, tell us how you began. Desperation. Really? I was totally desperate. Really? I would love to be able to say that, that I had always wanted to, to write, but that, that would be totally untrue. Um, no, I, I had turned 40 and um, I was unemployed once again. And I had travelled all around doing various jobs all over mm -hmm. the place. And here I was at 40 and finding myself um, on the scrap heap once, once again. Right. And uh, I saw an ad in the paper for the BBC Northern Ireland who were looking for, in conjunction with the Nerve Centre in Derry, who mm -hmm. were looking for short uh, film scripts from uh, first-time writers. Mm. And I thought, now there's something that I've never had a go at. You know, wouldn't it be lovely to sit down and... But how on earth do you go about writing a film script? Really? That's you how know? it was, Dad. That's how it was. And then I went along to a local library and got a wee book that showed you how it was laid out and things. And, you know, and um, I entered the competition. I didn't win it, but I, I did come to the attention of, of a script editor in Belfast who sort of took me under her wing. And here you find yourself standing in a thousand-seater yeah. uh, theatre, you know, when you've sold it out for that night and you're Absolutely. looking... Absolutely, and this is not your first play either. I mean, you've had many successes here in Oh, no, no, I've, I've got about nine now, about nine plays altogether now. Um, and probably more to come right. if people keep coming to, to, uh -huh. to, to see them. So maybe, just maybe, we'll end up working together someday. Absolutely, would love it. Uh, is, love that a, is that a handshake? That's a deal. <laughs> Sign the contract. <laughs> I think it's safe to say there's something for everybody around the walls. Part of it even runs through this bar here. Now, I've had great crack going around and I've learned so much about my own hometown that I didn't even know. Kathy, that's why you must enjoy your job so much. Indeed it is, bro. Well, cheers. Now tell me about that flasher. Now my mother and a friend, Rosaline, fell in love with your voice when you came on the scene. And they danced and sang in Derry when they played your tune. They said when you sing, it's like waving a wand. Something magic happens and the dance is on. And you'll always 